Damascus, Syria, 2010. First things first, we need to set the stage here. Syria in 2010 was about to slide into a hell I cannot even imagine, but it wasn't like what we think about the place now. That being said, it's been less than 30 minutes since I got off the flight, and I'm already feeling that knot in my gut, best described as, oh my fucking god, why did I agree to come here? The Syrian immigration border guard doesn't speak a word of English, but body language is international, and he isn't happy, shaking his head at my barrage of questions. I'm trying to buy a visa on arrival, perfectly legitimate for a British passport holder, but there's one small problem. The only currencies accepted are Syrian pounds and US dollars, and I have neither. I do have a wallet full of credit cards, British pounds and euros, all of which I've attempted to wave in front of the border guard's face, and all of which have been flatly rejected. Come on, how about British pounds? Like, they're still pounds? I hopelessly offer, attempting to slide a cr few crisp £20 notes across the counter in the hope that he'll pocket them and issue me the visa anyway. Is this bribery? Not sure, but it has worked for me in the past. In Ukraine's Kiev airport, historically a terribly disorganised and long-winded place, you used to be able to stick a couple of 20 euro notes in your passport and head through the diplomatic channel. Maybe this will work here. But no. Border guard shakes his head and gestures me to move over to the side. He's got other passengers to serve. Fuck. I take a seat on a hard plastic chair and curse my agents for failing to tell me that I needed US dollars. Acquiring some at London Heathrow would have taken less than a minute, but now, stuck in Syrian immigration limbo with no ATMs or credit card machines in sight, I am fucked. Excuse me, but are, are you okay? A Middle Eastern gentleman in a sharp suit sits down next to me. He's seen my problem and his English is impeccable. I've seen you have some problems entering our country. May I ask if I can help? Perhaps I can arrange entry for you and give you a ride to wherever you need to go after. I decline his request. He's probably just being kind. The Middle East is rather like that, with people far more willing to go out of their way for strangers than in the West. But this is fucking Syria after all, and I'm not taking any chances. I check my phone for the hundredth time since landing. No service. I've got a phone number th for the promoter, but it's fucking useless unless I can get a signal. I turn it off and on again. Eventually, after processing the rest of the passengers, Visa Guard closes up his booth and pulls down the blind. He's shut. No more visas today. It's 10pm, dark outside, and there are no more flights. I'm due on stage in two hours. So Visa Guard gestures for me to come with him and leads me to a back office where a bunch of other border guards sit around laughing, smoking and chatting in Arabic. One by one they listen to my story and shrug, laughing together about their lack of understanding. I'm pretty confident that I'm not in any real danger, but they clearly have no idea what to do with me. After being ignored for a few minutes, I stand up and make to head to the exit. Alright guys, thanks a lot then. See you later. No, no leave, I'm told like I'm a naughty schoolboy. I find the promoter's phone number and show it to the border guards who reluctantly agree to call it. At first there's no answer but I persuade them to call again and again and eventually they get through. A seemingly endless conversation in Arabic takes place before one of the guards leaves, returning five minutes later with a new person wearing civilian clothes. He is my promoter. He introduces himself and I immediately forget his name, sorry but I was shitting myself at this point, but nonetheless I am grateful as fuck to see him. Gareth, here you are. Come quick, you have to be on stage in an hour. Here's the small advantage of airports in developing countries. A well-connected individual can find themselves backstage smoking cigarettes with the immigration officers. Syrian pounds are handed over and a visa is produced for me. Then some very clipped, abrupt conversation and some sort of argument and we're out of there. So what was that about? I asked the promoter. Oh, nothing really. We were arguing about how many names he could have on the guest list tonight. We're close to sold out, so I'm limited in capacity. The immigration officers are coming to the show. What the actual fuck? This would not happen in London. Yes, of course. A small token of thanks for them not deporting you. As we blast through the streets of Damascus, I try to see something of the city. It is dark as fuck outside and there's little to see. But I can tell this place is ancient and wrapped in history and look forward to seeing it in the morning. Promoter speaks up. So we've had a little change of plan. The government removed our license for the original venue. So today we move the entire event outside. 
last minute venue changes are never good particularly tonight it is barely above freezing but soon we're close to the venue and my set is minutes away and I need to change my track pants selected for a comfortable flight are not quite suitable for stage wear there's no uh, with no green green room at the venue our car pulls into a restaurant there you can change in the toilets the promoter tells me Cigarette smoke hands heavy on the ceiling of the restaurant and Arabic music pipes through the speakers. I feel very out of place. I nod hello and head to the bathroom for a Clark Kent speed change. Sooner in the venue and the show looks good. There must be 5,000 people there. For 15 minutes to go, I head to the VIP balcony and am immediately struck by how fucking rich everyone seems to be. This isn't your normal VIP. There's plates of food being served, glass cabinets showing bottles of cognac. It is a serious affair, and even more impressive, given they've built the whole thing on a day's notice. Another thing about developing countries is that while there may be millions of people in poverty, the ruling classes are insanely fucking rich. And that's the crowd that are on the VIP balcony with me. There are more designer clothes and expensive watches than you'd find in a Hollywood nightclub. My friend the promoter introduces me to a friend of his, Aileen, and we chat for a few minutes. Then, showtime. I'm not sure why, but I've always been drawn to dangerous places, particularly any disputed territory. It's a strange obsession. Perhaps after travelling to 85 countries, I'm numb to the upside of safe, boring Western countries. Austria, New Zealand, Greece. Been there, done that. Give me excitement, culture shock and danger any day. The Syrian set goes without a hitch. The crowd, which witnessing only the second or third dance music show in the country, lap it up despite the freezing temperatures. It's now 2am, but I'm buzzing and I need a drink. The party is beginning to wind down, but I head back to the VIP and the promoter and friends are heading to Aileen's place in the city for a few drinks. On one hand, I'm buzzing about the show. On the other, I don't know this country, plus I do have a fly home in a few hours and going to a random after party in Damascus could lead to all sorts of unintended consequences. All things considered, it's pretty clear what the move is. I agree to go. Before long, we're back at Aileen's parents' place, a palatial accommodation situated in the old town of Damascus. Promoter's with us too, and he's my ride back to the airport, so at least my chances of making the flight are solid. What do you drink? Aileen asked me. You got any red wine? She shows me a rack of serious looking bowls. Most of the best stuff is at my parents' place in the country, but they keep a decent supply here in the city too. I pull out a few bottles and check the dates. 1982, 1999, 1962. Not a single bottle is under 10 years old and many are decades old. It looks like the sort of wine collection people spend a lifetime amassing. I pick the least expensive bottle and crack it open. And after giving it 10 minutes to warm up, it is stunning. Rich, full-bodied, like nothing I've ever tasted before. The three of us drink and chat for a few hours before Promoter pulls out a joint and offers me some wheat. What the fuck? The Middle East has notoriously strict drug laws, but by this point I've drunk enough not to care, so I get involved. Like, when is my flight again? I fucking love Syria. Minutes turn into hours, and then I'm struck by a beautiful, haunting voice over the city. So I take up a spot on the balcony to listen. It's the first Muslim call to prayer of the day, the Farj prayer, which happens, bet which happens bet um, between the very beginning of dawn and sunrise in Muslim cities around the world, projected by loudspeakers across the whole city. I listen intently as the first light of dawn emerges amidst the darkness. The last time I heard this prayer was in Jerusalem, a similarly historic city on a similar morning, and I remember my surprise at hearing the prayer drift over from the Arabic neighbourhoods in the city's east. Whilst not especially religious, I do consider myself spiritual, and it's hard not to be moved by the beautiful voice of the Mazian. For a short time, task lists and career aspirations are forgotten, and I allow myself to simply exist in the moment. Basking in my view of the awakening city, I watch the cracks of light appear amidst the ancient streets of the old town and feel profoundly grateful for my life. Then it's time to head to the airport. Arriving back at Damascus airport, it's now daylight and as I walk through the airport, my life seems faintly ridiculous. I've been up all night partying in Syria and now I'm walking through Damascus airport stoned. When my, pas when my passport is stamped without issue, the sense of release is palpable. I board the plane for London and pass out. Ten weeks after my visit, a brutal civil war strikes Syria, which will eventually be responsible for five million refugees and half a million deaths. I never see either the promoter or Aileen again, but every time I see the conflict on the news, I hope they're okay. For me, there as always, I'm happy to be on my way. <laughs>